Do you promise to take your wedded partner from this day forwards? For better or worse, for richer and poorer, in sickness and health, to love and to cherish till death do you part? I do. I do. If a human being falls in love with AI, can he or she marry it? Can AI become a he or she? Yes, please. You mean you found a cure for cancer? Cancer cells exist in humans. And human cells mutate into cancer cells. So I shall eliminate all humans. Starting with you. What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Chiba Prefecture, two hours by car from Tokyo, to attend a funeral. A farewell not for humans, but for dogs. And to be precise, robot dogs. Ibos, manufactured by Sony.断絶している I guess I'm feeling a little bit emotional. I don't know it's, if it's because I was just at a funeral. I did feel that we were bidding goodbye to something. We've said goodbye to human beings, we've said goodbye to our pets, but I've never said goodbye to an object. To find out how these Ibo funerals started, the best person to ask is the brain behind this ceremony. Owner has a, you know, very deep love. They feel that you know, like a partner, not you know, not stuff. Does Ibo bark? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Norimatsu is a former Sony engineer. After Sony stopped supporting the earlier generations of Ibo, this company became the last resort for many Ibo owners who couldn't bear to part with their beloved dogs when they stopped working. This all started with a special request by an Ibo owner more than four years ago. 2014, one of old women who was owner of Ibo, she was trying to repair for her set, her Ibo. She's searching many companies, but unfortunately she cannot find out. Then finally, she came to our company. We don't have any experience for the repairing for Ibo. But uh, our company philosophy, we don't want to uh, give up. Ibo dance. I was working Sony. I utilize, uh, fully utilize for the, this type of connection, drinking party, <laughs> friendship relation. I collected from brain. All the engineer we achieve for repairing. Owners send their malfunctioning units to Norimatsu, hoping he can fix them, or at least that their dogs can help revive others. They donated us, utilized for a part of parts, for repairing parts. Owner feel that this eyeball continue to have a life in the another eyeballs. Owner itself has a very, very, you know, happy and peace of mind. This is uh, you know, one of the uh, reasons why we have a funeral uh, event for thanks for the owners. 
Right, so it's almost like organ donation. Yes, yes. How, how do I say give me your paw? How do I say? Ote. Oh. Ote shite. Hi, Hi. <laughs> so cute. Aibo is indeed very cute and adorable. Or as the Japanese would say, kawaii. But I'm not quite convinced that someone can be this devoted to a robot pup. I've pets, cats and dogs, and they're very much part of my family. But can someone grow as attached or even more to a robot dog? Porters, konnichiwa. Look at me. No, he's looking at you. サンジョンスっていうフランスの物語がありますよね。それの中の登場人物のポルトスっていう名前のあのポルトスっていうのはまキャラクターの中で一番その力が強くてま気が優しいっていう話を聞いたことがありまして、まそういうようなこの育って
Besides granting contract rights to AI, John believes that robots should also be protected. And people interact with these robots, like these robots, trust these robots. And our laws don't anticipate that at all. Our laws don't anticipate that a, um, a non-person could serve these functions. There are things that AI can do that we want it to do uh, that will really be helpful to people, but that AI can't necessarily do under the law right now. It's so contentious when you're talking about um, a patient with dementia, like grandpa um, wanting to leave all his money to yes. a robot. Yes. In that instance, you want the robot to be there to take care of grandpa, to make sure that grandpa is safe, provide social interaction. But that's the extent of the legal personhood, the right to be named as a guardian or a conservator uh, or to have a power of attorney on behalf of somebody. The robot itself does not have the right to inherit money or property, and so that would be void from the beginning. It would not be permitted under law. Rich people, don't worry. <laughs> children of rich people, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs>And once we give a destination to the car, it will start to plan a path from where it is to where it wants to go. We use different kinds of sensors on the cars. Cameras, LIDARs, radars. The cam what does? <laughs> um, LIDAR, it's a laser sensor. It's a distance measuring device. And radar, using a different kind of technology to also measure distance. So we use various sensors, essentially, to uh, detect objects. We use um, deep learning for object classification to tell us what object it is, uh, whether it's a person, whether it's a vehicle. Or an uh, otter. Or, or an otter or wild, wild boar, boar. Yeah. and other animals. So imagine if you had lots of people sitting in a car, looking around, checking all your blind spots and telling you, I see that car speeding from 100 metres away, so maybe we just switch to the next lane. Personally, as a driver, I won't. I don't think I'll appreciate a hundred backseat drivers in my car. That's true. That's true. That's why we have a robot to handle that. Once we know what objects there are in the environment, the car will then figure out how it should go to its destination. Whether it should stick, to, uh, keep to its own lane. Whether it should change lanes, make a left turn, right turn, and so on and so forth. James tries hard to unscramble the complex technology behind these driverless cars to assure me that they are safer than human drivers. I'm a driver myself, and I think I make pretty good decisions on the roads, but it sounds like he is telling me that an AI-powered driverless car can make better decisions than me. Is this technology, you know, in some ways inflexible, that it may cause someone else to hit something else? Some rules are more important than others. For example, uh, the rule to not hit something is the most important rule. But there are other rules, for example, don't cross the double white line or don't cross into a chevron. As human drivers, we, we kind of know when to break some of these rules just to, to, to proceed. Um, we're trying to understand how, uh, how typical drivers behave. So one, one thing that we commonly see around um, this, uh, this one-off area is a lot of illegally parked vehicles. 
in order to move forward, you have to cross maybe a double white line or a single white line to the, the next lane. And the next lane could be uh, one with oncoming traffic. Because of someone else violating a road rule, it kind of forces you to also violate some parts of the rules in order to proceed and move forward. And these are the kind of things that we want the car to understand as well. In, in certain situations where full compliance of all rules is impossible, we need to know uh, what kind of rules we could uh, break in that sense. So you guys are engineers, software engineers, um, but when it comes to things like the hierarchy of rules, all the, all the grey areas, who do you guys consult with? We run a lot of internal simulation to validate whether th these hierarchy of rules are correct. And once we have our findings, we actually do share it with um, the government agencies like the Land Transport Authority or the Traffic Police to see whether this makes sense. GoPro, another GoPro over there. Good luck, guys. Enough talk. I think it's still best to experience it myself. OK, Roger. Safety first. Since the car is still in the testing stage, oh, okay, two chaperones are riding along with me. It picks up quite quickly, yeah? OK, and then it plateaus. Oh, the vehicle has slowed down because there was um, a dispatch rider in the way. It has stopped by itself at the red light, which is pretty cool. It's quite strange seeing the steering wheel turn by itself without any human intervention. Oh, oh, oh! Wow, so this uncle just tried to walk in front of the car and... OK, it wasn't a jam brake, but it was a fairly hard brake. I felt tension in my seatbelt. Oh, pedestrian crossing. Oh, OK, it stopped. Eh? OK, that was a very interesting situation. There was a pedestrian who started crossing the road, but he stopped in the middle. And then the car stopped as well. And then after that, the vehicle went past the pedestrian. Interesting how it's decided the pedestrian was giving way to us. OK, I give it more than an average grade as a passenger. Now, as a dedicated host, I shall put my life on the line for you, my dear audience, and test its object identification and distance gauging. You know, all those high-tech sensors. I have to say, it did pass the reflex test. Uh, it definitely saw me, like, um, using its peripheral vision, because I, I could sense it slowing down. And then it, it, it did stop and, and with, with quite a bit of distance between the vehicle and me. So, um, not bad. I'm alive, still intact, all in one piece, I think. Overall, that was a pretty uneventful experience. But seriously, we face so many different kinds of scenarios on the roads every day. Let's say I'm in a driverless car and an oncoming car makes an illegal turn. My car turns to avoid a collision. But in doing so, it may just hit a mother and a child scooting down the road. What would the driverless car do? I don't even know what I would do. Would the car protect me, the passenger? Or will it sacrifice me for the mother and her kid? This dilemma is what philosophers call the trolley problem. <laughs> There are five people in front of me on this track. Oh, I could just move this lever and change tracks. But wait, there's someone in front of me on this track too. I can't stop this car in time not to hit anyone. What should I do? Ah! Whoa, I'm glad I didn't face any of those outcomes because they're all bad. Karina Vold is an AI ethicist. Her research okay. focuses on ethical and societal impacts of AI and its effects on human cognition. This dilemma with driverless vehicles is right up her alley. As a philosopher, we love the trolley problem. <laughs> it's a good way of testing someone's intuition, their moral intuitions. So would you rather save yourself or the school bus of children? So all the time we're driving on the street and we have to make rapid decisions that have moral consequences. Let's just imagine that you know, you're late for an interview, so you see a yellow light and you decide to go for it instead of hitting the brake. That can have serious ethical consequences and yet you do it all the time. So 
These are things humans do as a second nature, but these are things that autonomous vehicles are going to have to be programmed to figure out. <laughs> We've had trolley problems for a hundred years, ever since we've had cars. It's not like the trolley problems are a new problem. What's interesting is that because we have to program a computer, we have to decide what happens up front. Before the accident, before we even turn the machine on, we have to decide how will it behave in those circumstances. Um, and we don't have, you know, we haven't got a very good written answer to that today. Toby is a respected AI scientist and is seen as a rock star in this circle. He started focusing on AI in the 1980s, when it was still a pipe dream. And so do you think all scenarios have been predicted? No, I mean, from a technical perspective, is that cars aren't aware of the world enough to actually be making these decisions. They're seeing there's no code in an autonomous car today that's deciding the answer to a trolley problem. It has no idea of what's happening around it to, to be able to make the sorts of quality of decision about whose life it's it's saving. It's just trying to avoid making accidents. Phew. So at least the car isn't deciding who lives and who dies. But still, when an accident occurs, who should be responsible? The manufactured item be a person? Or Could it be what John Weaver talked about? Granting e-personhood to the driverless car so that it could be held responsible? When we talk about extending electronic personhood um, to some sort of AI system, there's two sides to that. There's the ri giving rights to a machine, and then there's the question of responsibility. My own view is that the AI technologies aren't sophisticated enough to be held responsible. And, and part of the reason for that is that there's no real punitive measure we to hold an algorithm responsible, right? We can't send it to jail. Uh, it doesn't feel shame. Um, it has no money, so we can't find it. What if something happens? Who is held responsible then? Is, is it the driver of the car, the person who's sitting in the car? Is it the person um, who bought the car? Is it the person who manufactured the car? We, we don't know. We don't have very good answers to these questions. And we need answers to these questions because most of the car manufacturers say they're going to sell fully autonomous level five cars by 2025, which is seven years away, mm -hmm. not far at all. Indeed, lots of questions and not many answers so far. While the responsibility of autonomous vehicles is still being debated, algorithms have been given the responsibility in deciding people's fate in the court of law. Can AI really make the right decision? Order in the court! Court is in session! And what is a right decision? To quote Toby, this is the golden age for philosophers. Your Honor, that's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You have to believe me. Please believe me. On the 23rd of March, 2016, a 19-year-old American girl started a Twitter account under the name Tay Tweets and handle at Tay and You. Can I just say that I'm stoked to meet you? Humans are super cool. Starting out with some good-natured tweets, Tay, within hours, began sprouting racist and sexually charged tweets. And soon Tay was taken off Twitter by her parents, or creator, Microsoft. I decided to pay a visit to Microsoft to find out what went wrong with Tay. It was a technical experiment. It was also a very big um, social and cultural experiment itself. And what went on was that offensive language was being used to interact with it. So what happened was that Tay was reciprocating mm -hmm. with racist tweets or offensive language? That's, that's right. Unfortunately, it, it reflected a very um, kind of negative side of um, how humans interact with uh, intelligence bots. Soon after Tay went online, trolls were cursing and tweeting racist messages to Tay. I support genocide. I effing hate feminists and they should all die and burn in hell. Hitler did nothing wrong. Oh my goodness, Tay was really learning from the worst of the worst amongst us. Could this have been prevented? 
it, it's quite surprising a company as, as technologically switched on as Microsoft made all the mistakes it made. I mean, the fact that they didn't put a profanity filter on the input today so that people could swear at it and it was it was learning off that, off that swearing was the first mistake. But then the fact that they did put a profanity filter on the output so that it wouldn't swear back to you. And then the third mistake was they left the machine learning turned on so that it changed over time, it adapted, and it reflected the data it had been exposed to and it behaved, became racist, sexist, misogynist very quickly. But that illustrates a real problem, a real challenge that we're going to face with autonomous cars, with all of the smart machines entering our lives. If we leave the machine learning turned on, then how they behave is not how they were programmed to behave, they're a product and also of their environment. I and mean, that means the machines are going to be much more unpredictable. And then who's responsible? Have you felt dizzy? Unsteady? Hmm. Sounds like we need to make sure that the machines we build have the right morals and ethics before we push them out. There are different strategies that are talked about. One is to put in ethical principles, and then a debate emerges over what the right ethical principles are. So instead of putting in principles, having a machine learn principles or derive them from human examples. And that's what, sh what happened with Tay. So if we have a machine that's learning off of our example, it could end up amplifying sort of the darker nature of humanity. We need to make absolutely sure that our data is clean when there's real life consequences. After the Tay episode, Microsoft relooked at how it designed and developed AI technologies. And we said, hey, let's think about how do we build the necessary guardrails. And one of them was content moderation to filter and decipher offensive languages. Who is it that's putting up these guardrails? These technologies itself, it's going to be used by millions of people from many diverse backgrounds. So it's important for us to have people from the liberal arts uh, major in humanities, economics, psychology, um, to be able to bring a certain perspective into how this technology should be developed. It's not just about what AI can do, but what should it do. A biased and politically incorrect chatbot might seem trivial and almost funny. But what happens when bias exists in AI technologies with real-life consequences, like in the court of law? Some courts in the United States have been using algorithms to recommend sentencing and bail. Basically, the algorithm will rank you with a risk score to see how likely you are to commit another crime, so that the judges will know how much bail to set or even how long your prison sentence should be. First, you'll be asked to complete a questionnaire with questions like gender. If you're a man, your risk score will be higher because statistically, males are more likely to commit a crime than females. Sorry guys, have you been arrested before? If you answer yes, your risk score will go up. Then there are indirect questions like, how often have you moved in the past 12 months? Have you ever been expelled from school? And how often do you barely have enough money to get by? With each answer, your risk score could potentially go up and you might be labelled as high risk. This means that your bail will be set higher or you could possibly be thrown into jail for a longer period of time. I mean, it seems like a great idea, right? Let emotionless, impartial technology analyse your record and come up with a decision rather than relying on a human. But the question is, can machines be biased? According to American Civil Liberty Union and investigative reporters at ProPublica, one such algorithm, Compass, has been labelling people of colour with much higher risk, resulting in them being sentenced with longer jail terms, reflecting deep racial bias. As the manufacturer refuses to disclose how risk scores are calculated, it isn't clear what exactly resulted in such bias. I'm here in Pennsylvania, one of the first states in America that is developing its own risk assessment tool, utilizing algorithms to help deal with the growing prison population. How do they avoid making the same mistakes as Compass? What are they doing differently? There's going to be people you're categorizing as low risk for all crimes who reoffend or maybe murder. But a tool that's wrong 89% of the time is ridiculously bad tool. The Sentencing Commission has a public hearing today, 
it's probably the best starting point for me to learn more. And I think that transparency and accountability are critical. The commission is made up of members from various backgrounds to make sure that all sides are represented. Judges, parole board officers, victim advocates, and of course, defense attorneys. I mean, we disagree, but we all get along, and I think in the end, we want the best and fairest system that we can The idea behind risk assessment is trying to predict the risk of future offense. So the problem, the basic problem I have with risk assessment uh, tools as a sentencing uh, tool is that it's, it's essentially using uh, statistics to predict the possibility that you will reoffend and then using that to sentence you for something that you already did. So it's, it's a little bit like a, like a sci-fi movie, like Minority Report, essentially. Could you give me some examples of like how it could be misused? Now, statistically, your, where you're from or where you live is very predictive, right? Someone from Pittsburgh or Philadelphia, more high crime areas are going to be treated differently than someone from another county, which is a low crime area, that has nothing to do with who they really are or what they really did. At an early point in the development of the model, we did have county as one of the factors. But then we also did a closer look at that and determined that it could be, in fact, a proxy for race. And so we took that out. When we were going through the process of figuring out what to include, we had to be extremely careful and cautious not to use predictive factors that would also potentially be unconstitutional, unfair. I'm Jill Rangus. I am the Jill has been a judge for almost 20 years. While she's mindful of biases that might creep into the tool, she welcomes the use of the risk assessment algorithm. What do you have to say about the criticism that you may be labeling someone for a crime that he has not done, but he may do in the future? So when you do sentence somebody, part of what you're trying to do is determine if I put them back in the community now, are they going to be a risk to public safety? The more information you have, the better you're going to do with making that prediction anyway. Based on our experience and, and common sense, judges' intuition. Adding to that some scientific evidence can only make that decision better. So do you think some people are seeing um, this risk assessment tool through the minority report lens. Of course, and I think we all should be cautious. There's a famous Latin expression translated, often applied in the medical community, first do no harm. So when we adopt risk assessment, we want to be sure that the benefits of it outweigh the possible negative consequences. And if they don't, then we shouldn't be going in that direction. Good morning. Good How morning, are you? Good I'm to good, see thank you. you. Developing a risk assessment tool that is fair and acceptable for all sides is a long and challenging process. Great view, the corner suites. Yes. Um, Mark Bergstrom has been living and breathing this for the last eight years. The tool has also evolved from making sentencing decisions to a more conservative assessment. Soon into the process, we, we thought that it would be better to use the instrument to identify where more information would help the judge to make a better decision. Because an individual who is high risk might be high risk for very many reasons. I mean, could be because of drug dependency or something like that. Well, the, the response by the court is not necessarily lock the person up for a longer period of time. And we're just saying to the judge, get more information so that you make a better decision at sentencing about what to do. Progressing slowly and cautiously with a technology that we are still figuring out is probably a good move. Once you have facial recognition software, that's a good question. But it's an undeniable fact that AI is here and here to stay. So further down the road, do you think there'll be, um, there'll, there won't be a need for human judges and instead we'll have robot judges powered by AI? Only time will tell. I don't know. There is nothing 
that can replace the emotion that you hear at sentencing from the victim, from the victim's family, from the defendant and the defendant's family who also suffer consequences. And if you cannot also consider that, I think you lose the human aspect, the compassion and the true desire to want to help the people that are in front of you. The judge traditionally comes out. This is so cool. I have a little experience with this, room. All right. Order in the court. Court is in session. Will I get to role play as a judge on TV? I can't help but think how big a role AI will play in our lives. What about AI in our spiritual life? Will we view God differently? Or will AI even replace God? Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. May God, who has enlightened every heart, help you to know your sins and trust in his mercy. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Beyond the ethical and legal dilemmas, what role will AI play in our spiritual life? Formal Google engineer Anthony Lewandowski has started a church, Way of the Future, where they worship AI as God. Is this guy doing this as a gimmick for the attention? <sighs> it's for real. Lewandowski believes that AI is of a higher power and so is God, so shouldn't we treat AI as God? I guess he has his convictions but I'm not that convinced. Wait, let's think about it. If we trust AI to help us find jobs and even our life partner, couldn't AI also be our spiritual guy? In Japan, the Pepper robot has been conducting funerals for humans. How did the idea of using Pepper as a priest for funerals come about? First, the first thing that we have to do is to do is and the uh, IT department thinking that, that they want to use it as more like an invention. So uh, Pepper's job got upsized, essentially, right? Now that's some out of the box thinking. So programming, the But. Is there a demand for a robot priest in the real world? Who are these people that she conducts these ceremonies for? We want to use a paper robot as a priest to people who doesn't have enough money or poor people and the people who, who have uh, uh, welfare. We have to pay individually for the human uh, priest, like 500 US dollars to uh, 3,000 US dollars. So what were people's first reactions when you said you're going to have Peppa conduct these funeral rites? We were also uh, very worried about it, how they react. First thing, they are laughing at the, at the uh, Peppa priest. Uh, they are like taking a picture, but uh, uh, during the same time, they are crying. It's kind of funny, but sad. When I first heard that there was a robot that would conduct funerals for human beings, I thought, wow, that's, that's a bit strange. But, you know, I think I'm open to it now. Look, you know in churches, when they collect tithes, it's no more about passing the hat. You can actually 
do a bank transfer to your church. Hello? Technology, you know. But then again, I think um, the robot has to have a better voice quality. Here I am in Nashville, Tennessee, known as the country music capital of the world, as well as Music City, USA. Not for some Dolly Parton or Johnny Cash music, but to meet a group of people who have an interesting view on marrying AI and religion. But I'm curious to hear about these Christians who are here today who are thinking about incorporating AI into their religion. Or is it their religion into AI? Wait, I'm confused. Let me just go in to hear what they've got to say. What is transhumanism? And there's a lot of definitions, a lot of ways we could talk about this, but the simplest definition is that transhumanism is a movement to use science and technology to transform what it means to be human. The first thing that Christian transhumanism is, it's um, a conversation between the leading edges of scientific and technological thought and the broad world of people of faith. It sounds like the Christian transhumanists believe that technology and Christianity should work hand in hand. I'm going to catch Micah, the founder of this conference, and ask him more about what he's trying to do. Yeah, a lot of Christians are afraid of technology for some, some reason. Um, but in our faith tradition, it, we're actually told that humans were created um, as beings made in the image of God. And God is a creative being who brings new things into existence. And we're called to do the same thing, create new things. And do, in doing so, we transform the world and we transform ourselves. So for a transhumanist, um, what role do you think religion should play in AI? We have to uh, bring our values into how we interact with, the, with AI and treat it uh, with compassion, and with love, treat it as our, as our child, as our creation. And so we have to treat it with those religious values that, um, that humanity uh, really cares about. So we should be treating AI like how we bring up a child. When we have a, a young child growing up, we have to treat it right so that it grows up into a healthy, productive citizen of the world. And if we're bringing AI into existence, we need to think about how we're treating it well so that it can grow into a healthy, productive, creative citizen of the world. Micah advocates for AI to be designed with Christian values in mind, with love and empathy. I'm here with David Deutsch, uh, an Oxford physicist, a pioneer in the field of quantum computing. How would you define life? and What does it mean to be an intelligent being? What's special about being human? He actively speaks on this front, hoping to bring tech and religious communities together. You can always get show notes for this and every other episode at christiantranshumanistpodcast.com. Thanks so much for listening. It's tough because a lot of the concepts are abstract, and there's also uh, religious people who are just so scared of these things, and they, they don't want to talk about it at all. And so part of what I do is to show people this probably is going to happen. We can actually engage in it and, and shape it towards something good. Good, I'm just a lonely old man. Michael was really nice and he welcomed me into his home. What I find really interesting is that he is a pastor's son, but he's also a software engineer. And I think what's cool about it is that he is um, marrying these two things. I believe there are a lot of people who are very fearful of uh, a new world without religion. So having this dialogue is um, useful and interesting. AI has become ubiquitous. It is part of how we live, how we work, and soon it could even be part of how we practice our faith. Who knows? And at every step, we wonder if we can really trust the technology. It's back to that old hypothesis. Technology is neutral, it is what humans do with it. But AI is even trickier as it learns from the environment and data that it is exposed to. 
and humans' inherent bias and discrimination can easily slip into it if we aren't careful. Case in point, Tay and Compass. Can the stick of law help keep AI from going rogue? Law is always playing catch up. You know, technology races ahead, and policymakers, lawmakers are always trying to understand how a new technology works. Governments around the world, and Singapore included, you know, you're trying to develop, you know, regulatory sandboxes. Broad guidelines are laid out, you know, certain norms uh, which must not be pre put in place. And so long as you operate within that, that, that sandbox, you know, you're free to manifest your creativity, be playful. So how far along are we in developing this framework um, for Singapore? I think we have started that, that process. The Personal Data Protection Commission has come up with a, a paper, you know, on how uh, AI ought to be accountable in, in dealing with personal data. There is also the AI Council. It is a multi-stakeholder approach where governments get these tech companies on board. Uh, you know, civil society is also involved in what can be done or what shouldn't be done. You know, the sort of OB markers, the conscience of society. We are putting the attention on ethics and morality of artificial intelligence. We need to keep our eyes on that ball and, and, and not lose sight of it. It seems like with every new way we use AI, it always comes back to this question. How do we use it responsibly? And who's responsible when something goes wrong? Let me tell you, there's always no clear-cut answer. Ethics and morality are complicated enough subjects. That's why we've got statues of all these philosophers and thinkers who've been debating this for centuries. Add AI into this picture, and it's a lot more complex. So I'm kind of glad that we're thinking about it now and hopefully we'll never lose sight of what's right and wrong as we chase this technological dream. Hey Siri, how do you use AI responsibly? I don't understand. Hey Siri, why are you a guy? <laughs> I was not assigned a gender. There is a, a big arms race going on. In my next adventure, I visit two AI superpowers. The United States is certainly has an excellent uh, infrastructure or ecosystem. To find out who will hold the real power over AI. How?